My name is Barbara Hofer, and I'm going to make an interview with my colleague Stefan Lang from the University of Salzburg in Austria. Yesterday we heard that the skills that are demanded by the market are relevant for the growth of our sector. And I would like to ask Stefan what he can tell us about the inventions that are taking place in the academic field and how these inventions are transferred to businesses and also to broader groups of end users. Hi, Barbara. Yeah, that's really a great question. Um, so we all know that there is a lot of inventions going on, and first step is to really understand where these inventions happen and what is actually invented. Where is the technological advancement really taking place? So within this project that uh, I'm coordinating, it's called COPHUB.ac, and this is uh, to support the Copernicus Academy. We try to visualize a knowledge landscape. So that means to to represent, to visualize, to to find out actually where the um, innovation happens and where the inventions are are. Um, that's being done, and where actually the and how the, the knowledge and the expertise in various areas related to Copernicus are um, distributed all over Europe and basically also all over the world. So we're looking into the distribution of um, capacities in a technological way, in methodological competences, but also of course in specific application domains, um, and. This is, this is, on the one hand, of course, it's, it's a sort of a static representation, um, a snapshot, basically, but we also would like to see this dynamically because, of course, this knowledge landscape is permanently changing. We are acquiring new techniques, um, and uh, we are getting new experiences in one or the other field. So this, this knowledge landscape, as we call it, should be as dynamic as possible, and we are trying to come up with some technological uh, or technical solutions um, to, to make this happen. And how do we get from there? How do we move on? I mean, invention this is one thing, but how, how this innovation is really taking place. So innovation is a, is a process, of course, that entails different actors, so from academia, but of course also from businesses. So they uh, the actors that would take this invention up um, and ensure the innovation in their working processes. Yeah? And ultimately, of course, also the users, which they, they, they ask for this, that they knew, you know, uh, new kind of information. So um, we're looking into different fields or different aspects, different components of this innovation pipeline, as we call it, from invention to innovation in the end through information, events, and, and interactions. And one of these interacting events is a new form, let's say new format of a summer school, of a virtual summer school that will take place next, or well, basically this week. <laughs> um, but it's not only in, within one week, but it's really spread out over about one month. Yeah. So in a second we will we will hear from another colleague of ours, um Abba Wiedler, who is one of the main organizers of this summer school, how this new format looks like. I think it's it's um it's very innovative also um because what we try there is not only trying to integrate, let's say, new new tools, new ways, new new methodology uh, methodologies in um, well presenting and conveying the content, but also to um, experiment with a new mix of participation or participants basically. Yeah? So we have participants from all over the world, young students, young researchers, but also people from public authorities. And I think this is a very creative mix in this case. 
So this time of school is under the title Obaya for the Operational Copernicus Service Challenge. So what does it mean? Uh, Obaya stands for Object Based Mission Analysis. And this is an approach that has been developed here, <laughs> among other places in the world. Um, and it has turned out as one of the strategic key assets in image analysis, in automated image analysis. Um, and why that? Because this approach handles objects rather than pixels. And so this is also a little bit indicated in this sort of artwork that we have here in the banner. banner. So usually when we, of course, when we look at images, we perceive objects and we perceive relationships and um, geometric properties, spatial properties of objects, but none of us is usually uh, looking at single pixels. And this is sort of what is taken over from this, uh, by this Obaya approach, and it has to be, and it has turned out to be very powerful, in particular in land monitoring tasks. Um, so this is an example. I would say of an invention that is not brand new, not at all. It's about 20 years old already. But of course, it takes a lot of time until it is adapted by the community, first of all, by the scientific community, then by the service providers and users, and so on. And that's why it's called Obaya for the Operation Copernicus Service Challenge meaning that we want to really look into the applicability of OBIA methods in operational services, meaning services which are offered regularly, information products that are regularly being produced by service providers and being requested by the user community. So it's really something which is, um, yeah, at stake at the moment. It's also a sort of a skill set that is required, and um, therefore we are sort of matching, trying to match this demand with the um, academic or with the solutions that are provided by, by academia. And this matchmaking is, as I said, taking place in the summer school, and how this is actually done will be explained in a second by my colleague, Barbara Riedler. So this year's summer school Obaya for the Operational Copernicus Service Challenge is also new for us, um, new in various ways. Um, first of all, we wanted really to target um, at not so familiar um, target groups. So we aim at bringing especially public authorities with real world problems and then young researchers with their expertise and methods and students who have very often very innovative ideas together. So it should be a problem solution based approach. So first of all, particip participants can already choose when they're applying the fields that they're really interested in. So out of three, we finally um, included two of them, the Copernicus Land Monitoring and Climate Change Service in the summer school. Um, another aim was to integrate and present unfam unfamiliar methods, at least unfamiliar for public authorities um, within the summer school. So in this case, um, object-based image analysis. And then a main target was um, that people will submit their ideas of um, case studies. So real world problems um, with realistic background ground that can be solved with the learned methods and um, this will be implemented in group works where all these three, three target groups will work together on a solution. Um, another new thing, especially under the current circumstances, is a pure virtual format um, and this can really have also some um, assets. It can reduce restrictions for participants. So it can save money, travel issues, um, and time issues, and makes it possible to bring together a really international audience and also people that have maybe because of their work, some time restrictions, can participate. So I'm going to show you very quickly um, the agenda. So 
it will be a mixture of webinars, so online lectures where um, people, also very high level people from ESER or um, EEA will give the presentations and overview of specific topics. Um, and then for three weeks, um, online lectures and hands-on sessions will be available to the participants for self-studying. And after they receive the background um, and the methodological competence, they will work for another two weeks virtually together in group works for um, these case studies. They will then finally be presented at, in this case, also virtual conference at the TI Forum. So just very quickly that you get an idea on how the content will be presented to the students. So this is an online learning platform where all the different lectures, hands-on session, and then also group works are available. And as an example, for example, a lecture on the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service includes a brief introduction, some available videos, presentations in this case um, of the EEA, and then also some interactive content for the students that they can check on their learning experience. Thanks a lot. Hello, this is Stefan Lang speaking from the University in Salzburg, Department of Geoinformatics. And I would like to share with you a few insights um, in the new learning tech tools that we are using um, in combination. So um, what we're doing currently is to revise completely one of the courses that we're offering on the bachelor level. It's an introductory course to remote sensing, uh, practically from more from a practical point of view. Um, so sort of an exercise course. Um, and we are at the moment converting this course completely based on the tools that we are developing in eo 4 geo and new learning tools, new platforms that are available. So um, this is a very, very brief summary of what we are doing here. And I also show you then an example um, back in the, in the browser. So um, it's a sort of a suite of different learning tools or learning um, environments also. So the idea is obviously to use open source, uh, open accessible software, and not too many proprietary tools. So um, to limit that in a way, um, in order to also make the, the course contents uh, available and searchable and so on. Um, so first of all, obviously we need a learning platform. We need a repository where we put the course material in and we're using Moodle instances for that. Um, um, so this is the example of the summer school which is currently going on and you've heard a few things about that in the other small presentations. Um, <clears throat> so this is our course repository and um, yeah, so what else do we use? So we have some interactive elements like uh, using H5P um, for, you know, stimulating interaction with the participants and uh, also some self-learning, self-assessment exercises. Um, then the entire, the, the slides, basically, the slides are created using Reveal.js, so that's a JavaScript environment, um, fully based on HTML, HTML5. Um, so you can do your um, scripting in any of the editors, but you can also use Markdown, for example, for easier scripting. Um, and then for to illustrate some of the contents also to do some basic calculations or some interactive elements on this side where you really work with data, quantity elements, and you're producing charts and so on, you can 
who we are using um, Jupyter notebooks for that, which are stored in a GitHub environment, so it's again um, accessible for anyone. So, and all these tools are of course also linked to the EU4Geo tools, as I will show you in a minute. So, um, for example, to the body of knowledge, to the living textbook, um, and uh, also other EU4Geo tools, as you've uh, heard in the other presentations. And obviously, of course, we also use other tools and interactive platforms which are out there in the internet. Um, so, for example, the Sentinel Hub, Sentinel Playground, um, and um, a few other things existing to be the notebooks, for example, um, as it is in the uh, Proba V exploitation platform, for example, or many other things. You know, there is an endless, <laughs> an endless uh, sea of different availabilities. Okay, let me briefly switch to um, Chrome. So this is now, let's say, the starting slide of this reveal-based course that, uh, as I said, we are adapting. Um, so you can browse through that. You know, there's different hierarchical, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of vertical and, and horizontal structure. So this is the table of contents. And for example, if we want to um, go to chapter two image repositories and data access, um, we have an intro slide to this particular unit. And then we have different lessons. For each of the lessons, we have learning objectives. Um, and for each of the lessons, we have also the, the content and topic, topics listed. So here, for example, we have the Lesson 2.2, uh, .2, Data and Information Access. Here we have um, the contents and the topics. And uh, you will also see that we have links to the uh, BOC concepts uh, in case they are there. Um, so here, for example, you could move directly into the Sentinel Playground. Um, and get access to this in order to search for Sentinel data. Um, also, what we what we have here, for example, is in the visualization and exploring image data section. Is um, an access to a web tool which is called EO Compass. Um, so the EO Compass is a in-house production of ours. Um, and it's basically a metadata-based tool that analyzes or that's permanently harvesting the, the metadata of which is generated by Sentinel-2 um, about uh, all kinds of things, um, quality, quality, measures or and of course acquisition date and so on also cloud coverage um, and this is then um, also accessible here through the slideshow so you will directly go into this application you can launch it from here and you can get an overview of the um, of the sentinel tool coverage so here for example the number of scenes per tile so it's uh, querying basically the entire um, archive so far. Yeah. But if you're interested in if you're interested in um, a particular tile, so I'm gonna go, I could also place name in Salzburg here. And I would go there, and I'm interested in the particular tile. I can open the respective information or the statistics for this particular gradient. Okay, um, third thing that I wanted to show to you is the um, the use of Jupyter notebooks. Um, just briefly going back. Sorry, this is a little bit. I have to get used to the navigation here in reveal 
it works quite well and you can also use absolute links and you can use IDs and names for the for the sections or the slides but it needs some practice so if I go here for example uh, unit 3 specifics of image data and again we have different lessons lessons um, and one of the lessons is about histograms yeah so and one of the um, content sections of this lesson is about the interpretation of histogram. So what is an histogram actually? You can check it up here and this brings you directly to the body of knowledge. Um, so here you get an um, information about histograms, what it is, how it is defined from a concept point of view. Yeah? Um, the third section would bring you to histogram generation. So here you can use an interactive um, Jupyter notebook that uh, allows you to understand to generate a histogram from an image matrix. And it's a very tiny small image matrix used here. Just a four by four uh, little hypothetical matrix but this is also um, then shown how uh, histograms are generated and of course you can use um, other data as well you can also use real data okay so this reveal course is being accessed as I said uh, before um, from a Moodle interface so here for example we have this Moodle repository for the GeoBio summer school which is taking place right now and uh, as you saw before there you have also some um, content sections and uh, many other additional material is available and here for example you would have a interactive H5P element um, that would allow students to better understand the product the land monitoring product portfolio so which types of information products are used on which level so obviously in the tour 2000 areas I probably mapped on local level while you have uh, biophysical parameters like leaf area index for the global global level and for example you would have the um, high resolution layers on pan-european and then you do it for the whole thing and then the system will tell you how successfully you did this exercise okay so that's all from my side um, thanks a lot Hello, good afternoon, dear participants of the EO Summit. So for this session, I welcome Peter Zeil and Veronika Krieger from Spatial Services Limited in Salzburg. And uh, we will talk a little bit about how we design learning scenarios and planning the related training actions in the EO4, Pro EO4 Geo project. So Peter will start. And um, yeah, have a nice time. So Peter, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan. Now, welcome to this uh, Il Grande Finale uh, of this um, session. Um, as you have seen from the title, we will show the way how we actually design learning scenarios and uh, the re and also deduct from that uh, the related um, required uh, training measures. Okay, so this is the setting. Yeah? Um, very often we have new challenges and then uh, stakeholders like authorities, like uh, service providers, um, research centers, they are looking then for the adequate uh, occupational profiles um, to find the people who actually address these challenges. And here, I mean, the job offers um, um, are required uh, to actually fill positions to actually act on this. On the other hand, um, academia they need to respond to these requests by 
designing, developing relevant training measures uh, for staff from authorities or service providers. And, I mean, they need to develop the relevant curricula to provide actually the requested academic degrees to fill these positions to respond to the new challenges. And here is the flow. Yeah, from new challenges via the EO for GEO um, pleura of um, tools, we would then arrive at new skills. Now here is an example. What we try to do is to actually assess the policy context for the case-based scenarios. And here you see that the cases we actually try will develop in eo 4 geo um, are here sorted to the key policy uh, issues. The Green Deal, of course, this is the thing at the moment. The Paris Agreement on Climate uh, Change and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. So here you see topics which had been selected and will be worked out in um, cases and relevant training actions. Now, uh, I apologize for the not very um, uh, high quality diagram, but I couldn't find something better on the EU website. Um, this is the topics of the Green Deal. Now, here we picked out, just for an example, one. Um, here, for example, and uh, we can uh, highlight that a little bit, preserving and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity, which is one of the um, pillars of the Green Deal. Now, the question is, I mean, what I is now required in the Green Deal or will be in future for the required to implement uh, by different stakeholders to actually uh, towards the achievement of the Green Deal. So here we are in the same situation. Now we have the Green Deal as the new challenge and what is now required in skills to address the objectives of the Green Deal. Let's take an example. Here we try to um, dissect from the uh, regulation or from the document of the Green Deal to see how, in this case, biodiversity loss in the EU um, is actually um, caused by certain issues yeah and here you see that you have to read the diagram from the bottom yeah so um, missing insufficient and deficient indicators for green or biodiversity the lack of capacity for enforcement of the regulations then insufficient and outdated spatial data they lead to increased soil um, sealing rate, to uh, increase soil sealing rate uh, by construction and building activities and so forth. Yeah, I mean, we have to find basically the concrete issues on the ground. So from the problem analysis, we actually then come to the objectives. Yeah. Here we just take out um, these two um, problems, yeah, reduced green areas in European cities and decreased biodiversity in urban spaces. And then we go uh, actually to um, the objectives and look for the stakeholders, yeah, okay. And here you see that the biodiversity loss in the in the EU um, could be reduced by um, 
green areas in European cities are maintained or increased. Yeah. Biodiversity in urban spaces is increased and so on. And here we then can select basically the objectives where certain actions on the ground uh, are necessary. And in blue, you can see these are the stakeholders uh, at the different levels which need to be um, involved, yeah, like uh, municipalities, city planners, and so on. And this is how we go with the participants of training measures through these issues that they can see the whole uh, complex of an issue. And then we come to that, what you have seen already, the business process modeling yeah, of to find the tasks which need to be carried out. Yeah. And here you see that the actors in the orange um, dots yeah, are the ones which directly have to be addressed by training. Together, of course, with stakeholders. And here we see that training measures in this context are not always only technical. Yeah? They also need to um, address the people who actually receive products, receive services. So here we can go through a whole sequence of um, processes in this regard yeah? um, to find out what is involved yeah, and what needs to be known um, at different levels. And here we also find out things which are not now is observation or GI. Yeah? I mean, developing an offer to meet a request, yeah? a request by a municipality to actually find out urban green spaces in their um, territory or to negotiate contracts. So these are all skills which are involved in this whole process. And also then at the end, yeah, I mean, to see how are things being delivered? Yeah? Uh, how are products, services be validated? Yeah? And also this is part of the process. So by that, we actually start then to develop the relevant training measures. And here you see an example, a workshop, evaluation and planning of urban green structures to increase the quality of life and support of ecosystem services in urban environments. And this diagram shows you how these things are being um, developed to adequately address all the steps which are actually required in this case. Yeah. Here we have a workshop, let's say a duration of five days, with participants coming from different organizations related to the topic. We have local administrations and municipalities, so on a management level, because they need to know. Then. We have administrations, municipalities, and service providers. These are more the technical experts. Um, and then we also might have academia and vocational education levels. So here we start then to um, dissect these uh, training measures at diff in different levels, yeah? different uh, uh, levels to be addressed. We have transversal skills yeah? in context analysis, problem and objectives analysis, stakeholder uh, analysis, for example. And we have at the end also transversal skills in um, visualization and presentation and also validation of results. And in the middle, we have actually that, what is the core topic here, the, the semantic skills, you know, the uh, EO and GI components.
but they are embedded in basically in this uh, or have to be accompanied by these transversal skills. All these elements are linked to the EOGI BOC concepts, which you have heard already. And here I would now um, hand over to Veronica um, to see how we do this linkage uh, to the EO and BOC concepts. Veronica, over yes. to you. Thanks, Peter. Hello from my side as well. So, um, yeah, here we can see as well the transversal and thematic skills again. And here's listed what they are. Um, so, in, within the thematic skills section, that is um, in the in the red box, um, you can see different lectures or hands-on sessions and group projects. So, to show you the connection to the BOC concepts, I picked one, um, namely the satellite imagery and availability and specifications. Um, and yeah, here in this word cloud, you can see um, BOC concepts that are connected to this one, um, like census, data processing, visualization, and so on. And to top it off, uh, on the right side, you can see the connection um, to the structure of the EU4GEO um, workflow, um, where we have the BOC concepts as the, the basis to develop the other, other tools. Okay, and yeah, finally, we show you the tree that you already know um, that shows that like the concepts and the skills and tasks, they are all, um, yeah, built one, one group and they, they might le lead to new skills. Well, that's all from my side. So thank you for listening. And we hand over back to Stefan again. OK, great. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Veronica, for these insights into the, let's say, logic and strategy for user-required, user user-defined um, training actions. I think this is a very, a very important element in the entire uptake process and um, yeah also a nice allegory in the end with this tree so i think that yeah brings us a, brings us a little bit back to real world and so this is where i say goodbye for this session thanks again for joining um, and having having a nice coffee break thanks virtually or real ciao bye bye Okay, um, good afternoon. Um, now we have this session um, of the learning scenarios. You have uh, seen uh, what uh, and how uh, these uh, different new actions uh, have been developed partly and how they will be developed for these uh, scenarios. Now, as you know, you can uh, pose your questions and uh, please also um, indicate um, maybe to whom uh, you would like to ask these questions. We have here um, Stefan Lang um, and Veronica Krieger. Uh, we might also be joined later on by Barbara um, Wiedler. So uh, these are the topics uh, open now for your questions. So if you don't um, have any questions, um, then I would like to stimulate um, the discussion um, maybe with um, my colleagues here present. And uh, 
you can um, either um, complement this uh, discussion uh, or you ask your own question. Now here, um, the um, issue is uh, maybe in the focus uh, of the, the first um, presentations were the summer school. Yeah. Um, Stefan, could you maybe give, a, you mentioned that there is an international uh, participants of the summer school. Can you quickly um, maybe give us some statistics uh, how many of these are from Europe and uh, how many are from outside of Europe? Um, yeah, so the, the summer school is currently going on, as I said. We started on Monday, and so we have 35 participants. We have limited, actually, the number of participants to 35. It was, of course, much more um, applications, and we had really a rigorous selection process. Um, obviously, it's quite attractive because it does not involve costs. Of course, it, it, it involves your time investment, but no other costs and actually sponsored by the COPPA project also. Um, so in terms of statistics, I don't have the exact figures, but just to get you an, an idea, we have multinational, multicultural, multilingual, whatsoever, and different time zones. So this is a challenge that we are facing. Um, so the webinars will be afternoon uh, between 1 and 3, 1 and 4, so to accommodate the different time zones, which span from Chile um, to over Australia, or you go the other way around, Africa, uh, Nepal, Asia, several uh, countries in Asia. Um, so I would, I would say it's about one-third European and two-thirds outside Europe. In terms of the composition, in terms of, let's say, students, researchers, uh, public authority representatives, I think it's, um, well, I would say, of course, the majority is, is uh, people are in there, not really, not really, uh, but definitely postgraduate, so PhD students, most of them, or they, they're in sort of an advanced level. Um, but at the same time, we have, for example, a participant from the public authority in uh, in Dubai, you know, the city administration, or we have um, a few other examples <clears throat> from from China or elsewhere. Okay, thanks, Stefan. Um, now, um, I um, uh, question how many participants we still have uh, because it's very quiet in the in the question. Um, folder um, but we just try to to go along um, we then um, you touched on the in in all basically in all uh, questions um, we have already indicated that um, the um, learning content needs to address uh, specifically also uh, the application of all this methodology. Yeah. Um, now, uh, Veronica, you have um, developed, as far as I know, um, also for the summer school, a certain session on heat islands. Um, how will they, this uh, section, address actually the need and who are actually the ones who would need to know uh, about heat islands? Okay, um, so as already said before, um, the summer school also addresses public authorities and especially for urban heat islands like SIP, the information is important for city planners, for example, um, that they can see how to um, yeah, plan, for example, urban green spaces to um, yeah, to to avoid urban heat islands at specific places. Okay, thank you. Now uh, questions are coming in. Um, 
I take uh, the one from Sander. Uh, how can someone from another profession come to work and learn about air quality in heat islands? But not only that seems, also another. How can someone from another profession come to work and learn? Um, I think, Stefan, uh, this is one for you. Yeah. So, so this new format, as we call it, um, very unspecific, but it is indeed a new format. We are experimenting a little bit with a different way of interaction. So it means it's less a sort of a learning environment as a learning classical ways that you get um, uh, frontal um, lessons and you're listening and then you may interact. But, you know, it's, it's sort of emerging from the participants themselves. They have a very clear... Um, ambition to, to learn from each other and there is different levels and there is no problem whatsoever in that. There is different levels of expertise. So there are people in there who have, who have maybe heard about Copernicus as a, as a, as a, as a mystic miracle or <laughs> something um, and others who do have a lot of experience in even you know, programming and, and, and utilizing Sentinel data frequently. So this is just an illustration that there is a certain span in, in, in um, or yeah, uh, a large difference also in, in expertise. And some of the <clears throat> people were quite concerned <clears throat> whether this turns out to be fruitful in the end, yeah, but we will see. Um, so I would encourage everyone, it's not only about the summer school, but you know, we have to be ready to, to um, move a little bit beyond, let's say, the classical silo type. Uh, way of education, yeah, because um, th there is a need out there. There is a lot of distributed experiences. Um, could also be cultural experience. Could be the the finding the right words, finding the right language, you know, to communicate, to convey things, to um, yeah, effectively interact. Um, and this is where we where we try to find new ways to to untap this potential from a mixed from a deliberately mixed group. Okay, thanks, Stefan. Um, I have to look at the time a little bit. We have uh, just a couple of minutes left, um, but um, I would actually um, try to summarize this. Uh, uh, session. You have seen that there are new things um, on the blog, um, the, uh, um, the different ways how to address these uh, challenges, new challenges, and then come down uh, through actually um, learning passes, um, curricula, uh, and uh, the body of knowledge uh, to actually form new skills. I would like to recommend you um, to uh, visit the uh, websites uh, of AO4Geo, of course, because this is where uh, all these things um, are laid down uh, in conceptual way, but also to the uh, what has been mentioned by Stefan, the cophub.ac website. Um, and here you can find what uh, actually the um, um, Copernicus Academy um, role is in uh, making all these things um, applicable. I see now that there are more questions coming in. Um, I'm sorry, but we, due to the very tight schedule, uh, we have to uh, close uh, the session. But I would uh, recommend you that these questions maybe be addressed uh, to the individual experts uh, by their websites, uh, by their um, email addresses. And I thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, thank you also, Stefan, Barbara and Veronica uh, and the organizers. Thank you very much.